and welcome to the second webinar of Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, or QBRI, for early career researchers. I am Salam Saloum, a postdoc at QBRI, and I'm the moderator for today's event. In our first webinar, Dr. Richard O'Kennedy gave us important tips on how to build a scientific career development plan. He shared with us his early research days and inspirational journey in science and leadership. For those who couldn't attend the webinar, please find the recording link in HPKU YouTube channel. Today's webinar is about writing a successful grant for biomedical scientists, the NIH format. The webinar will include an outline of what reviewers are looking for in a proposal and how to succeed in achieving a favorable review. The webinar is structured to have a presentation from our guest speaker for about 30 minutes, then an interactive discussion with our speaker, and the last 15 minutes will be for questions from the audience. As a reminder, this webinar is interactive, so please send your questions by using all panelists option in the Q&A tab. So without further ado, it's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker who joined us from the US. Dr. Nasser Zawiya was the Dean of the Graduate School and the Ignacural Director of the Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Program at the University of Rhode Island. He also played a funding role in the formation of the George and Anne Ryan Institute for Neuroscience in Rhode Island. He was the Assistant Director of the Rhode Island Biomedical Research Infrastructure Network, the first of its kind in the state with eight participating universities. His research is focused on environmental risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and discovering new treatments for neurodegenerative diseases. He has repurposed a drug for the treatment of tauopathies which was granted an orphan drug status by the FDA, the EMA, and an IND for clinical trial. His research has been supported by numerous grants awarded to him as a PI and co-PI from the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, the National Science Foundation, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Dr. Nasser, welcome, and thank you for your time today to talk to us about grant writing. I'm really captivated by the numerous grants you've achieved during your career. We look forward to learn from you today. And now allow me to pass you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salam. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to uh, um, share with you my knowledge and, you know, regarding grant writing and uh, what we you know and the, uh, suc the successful uh, process of writing a grant and actually getting it funded. Um, I'm going to speak to you uh, mostly, you know, um, from the all well, mainly from all perspectives, because I have been an applicant, you know, to for grants. I have been a reviewer for grants. I have chaired, you know, review study sections. So that has given me um, the, you know, experience to look at it from different uh, perspectives as an applicant, as a reviewer, uh, and so on. This uh, webinar is designed so that um, you can all benefit from it, regardless of what stage in your career you are. Uh, I've written it in a general way, and I really would like to hear many questions because the bullets and the information you get, you can just read it, uh, but there is some you know, issues that need further explanation. Maybe we can do that in the Q&A session. But if you are a pre-doctoral student and you're planning to write your thesis, Proposal, this would be very beneficial to you. If you're a postdoctoral uh, uh, person, this also be very beneficial to you if you're writing grants or writing projects. And if you're early career, you know, scientists or faculty, I think you'll find this to be very, very useful. Uh, the reason I chose the NIH format is because it's the format I am most familiar with. And in my opinion, it's one of the best formats in the world because the National Institutes of Health of the United States reviews thousands and thousands uh, of, of grants a year and have been doing so for almost a century uh, and, you know, awards billions of dollars of funding uh, uh, every year. And you have to be very competitive to get that. Um, so that's, you know, the background I'm coming from. However, it doesn't really matter when you're applying, you know, if you take the principles of grant writing and you understand the basics that we will discuss today, 
uh, uh, whether you're applying, you know, to uh, Qatar Foundation, QNRF, or you're applying to any other organization in the Gulf or, you know, to international organizations in Europe, uh, whether you're an engineer or whether you are a biomedical scientist, regardless of that, I think the same principles uh, are, you know, uh, the ones that you can learn today. And if you apply them, you can increase your chances of getting, you know, a, a grant. So let me begin, you know, first by saying, when do we, when and how do I start? You know, that's usually the question that, you know, many ask. Uh, so maybe you have to do, you know, a thesis and therefore you need a proposal for that. And uh, maybe someone alerted you that there is a funding opportunity an organization, you know, is asking for proposals. So you are interested in writing for that, or maybe you have a problem and you want to uh, write, you know, a proposal to get funded to solve it. Or someone may have recruited you, a collaborator or a friend or, you know, a principal investigator recruited you and asked you to come and join them in writing a grant proposal so you can get funded to do something together. The most important thing in all of these, regardless of, you know, how you started or what initiated you to do the uh, proposal or how to write it, you must have an innovative idea. It has to be something new. Nobody is going to give you money to do something that's already done. So it must be innovation is the key, you know, to the uh, a proposal for you know to raise interest and to get it really funded. So what is a proposal? Um, you know, a proposal outlines a detailed plan on a project for consideration by a funding agency. Or it could be your committee, you know, in, in the graduate school or, you know, or, you know, some, some other, you know, entity. And as I mentioned to you, the format, you know, the structure of the application may vary from agency to agency. It depends on the culture and the history of that agency and, and how its formats, you know, its uh, elements of a proposal. So the format may vary, but the essential common elements across, you know, regardless of what organization you're writing to uh, and, you know, or who you're applying to. Uh, in some cases, before there is a proposal, you know, in order to cut down on the numbers, you know, they may get uh, hundreds of, you know, proposals and organization or agency may ask you to send them a short one, two page paper. What is your concept? of the proposal you plan to write. Uh, and based on that, they will invite you to a So sometimes they are what we call a concept paper. Some people refer to that as a white paper. It has to be short, one to two. It has to have, you know, uh, just the idea, the hypothesis, title, very, very few elements uh, in it for them to see whether what you are going to write fits what they are asking for. Uh, and that saves you time and it saves them time, you know, it's reviewing many, many proposals that are not responsive to the request that they made. So an organization, you know, we usually use the uh, term RFP request for proposal request a proposal. Uh, or sometimes you might initiate that like for the National Institutes of Health, there are many different kinds of grants. There's grants called R01. These are like the gold standard. If you're successful as a biomedical scientist, as a researcher, then you have been awarded an R01. Uh, and those are investigator initiated. So no one is giving you a topic, no one is giving you a title. You have an idea and you put your proposal around it and you submit it, so that's initiated by you. Or you may be doing an R21, what they call an R21 or an R03. These are numbers you don't need to remember unless in the future you're interested in, in, in NIH. Those are responsive to an area that they have designated. They may want someone to write, you know, a uh, exploratory proposal or short uh, a grant on autism or specific act of, of, of autism, or it could be cancer, you know, so they'll define what are the grants they want to receive in the area of, uh, of research for the proposal. So two mainly, uh, investigator initiated, which is you initiated, you have your own idea, you want to write the proposal uh, and, you know, uh, send it to a funding agency and they will review it and, and give you a score. 
or it's responsive to a request for a proposal. And there they have defined the topic, they've defined what the mechanism, what they're looking for, how the funding, the amount you know, of money they will give for the project. Uh, in terms of the NIH, for example, for R01s, they don't de determine the amount. You, you submit a budget and if they like it, they'll fund it. So, you know, one of the most important things, you know, before you write a proposal is really put yourself in the reviewer's uh, uh, role, you know, and I have done that. And, but, you know, the best way, obviously, to learn how to write proposals is to keep writing them. And to have, you know, the resilience and the persistence that is going to come back, it's going to be returned until you learn how to write a, you know, a proposal that not will only be acceptable and will only, you know, be very good, but good enough to be funded. Um, so, you know, our reviewers, you know, they're very busy people. And, you know, as you can see in the image, uh, in, in the, in the, you know, they may either sit around the table and there could be 30 of them, or this could be done online, but they have many, you know, proposals to review and to discuss. So, they, you know, the questions reviewers are looking for is what is the merit of the study? Uh, does it have any merit? Uh, they are interested in what is the potential impact of the work? You have to do work that's impactful. Otherwise, it could be very, very interesting, but it's not, you know, impactful. And impact is something that's very key into scoring, you know, a grant uh, application. Very, very important, as I mentioned to you in the beginning, how novel is the idea? Is this something new? Uh, is this something new? Uh, obviously, if it's not new, they will just throw it in the trash can. Uh, so there has to be some novelty, some innovation to the idea. Um, the reviewers will ask, is the research likely to produce new, new data, new concepts? Will something come out of this work? Why should we give, you know, a Dr. Salam $500,000? Will she produce something, you know, that will uh, be useful? Will she, you know, contribute new data? Uh, there has to be a hypothesis that's valid. Uh, and is there evidence for the hypothesis? Very important part is you have to have a working hypothesis. There has to be some hypothesis underlying a proposal. And the reviewer has to know what is the working hypothesis that you are writing this whole project on. Uh, and so you have to be clear. And the hypothesis, as I'm gonna mention later, has to be stated from the first summary abstract page so that the reviewer sees it and they, you know, they know exactly uh, uh, under what terms you are, you know, going to write the proposal and to address what, you know, uh, questions. Uh, another thing they will look for is when you make aims. They want to see that the aims are logical, uh, that they are sequential, and the aims are tied to the hypothesis. When they look at your methods, they're going to look: Are you using appropriate procedures? Are they adequate? Are they feasible to do? Okay, so that's very important. Um, are the investigators, or if it's the students, uh, or the team, are they you know qualified? Do they have the experience and the training and the background to execute this project? So investigators have to ask these questions. They have to be sure that the facilities and the environment where the research is going to be done is very conducive to do the research, very supportive for the research. Uh, you can't be in a place where, you know, they don't have a centrifuge and propose you're going to do separation of cells, uh, so, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So the environment has to be there. And the environment is not just about equipment. It's about, you know, senior investigators, junior investigators, students, uh, postdocs, it's a community. Uh, it's an enriching environment that will support you and help you, you know, to succeed. Facilities, space, computers, all of that needs to be outlined. So these are important questions a reviewer has in mind and is looking for before they even start to look at your proposal and, you know, consider it, you know, for, uh, for funding or for scoring. 
So in the NIH format, and as I mentioned to you, a lot of what I'm bringing to you is actually taken from the NIH websites and, and, and over there is information that provided by, by NIH uh, to, uh, um, um, you know, uh, to potential applicants that, um, and, and it's an area where, you know, that I'm most familiar with. So the NIH format usually uh, is the first thing there is the specific aims, and that's one page only. You know, and there are page limits. It's very important. You may can ask for a million, or you can ask for ten million. Sometimes the page limit is six pages. Sometimes it's ten pages. It's twelve pages. But the specific aim page or the summary it's referred to in many different you know uh, terms. The abstract that is one page. And this is where you list the broad long term objectives and the goal of the specific, you know, uh, proposal. Uh, and it, it's here that you're going to sell me the idea. It's here you're going to make me interested to read on. It's here you're going to get my excitement that I'm going to read your work and I'm going to analyze it and look at it because in this one page, you have to state your hypothesis. So I know what you're working on, uh, or if you're working on a novel design, I need to know what are you designing, uh, or what problem are you, you know, you know, uh, solving. Uh, you may be challenging an existing clinical paradigm or a clinical practice. I want to know what you know. Are you looking at what barriers in the field are you addressing, uh, and you're trying to uh, you know overcome in order for the field to move you know forward. Or maybe you're developing a new technology, a new device, and a new software. In this specific aim page, in this summary page, uh, you need to capture everything. You need to put the hypothesis, the idea, a brief introduction of why you want to do the work, the design, or the problem you're solving, and you need to list the aims, you know, the goals by which you're going to achieve, uh, uh, by which you're going to answer the questions that you have raised. This is something, you know, I've learned of writing many and many grants over the years. You have to spend the most time in, you know, even if you spend a whole week to write one page, it's very important because this one page will help you summarize and focus your ideas and understand exactly what you're going to do. You know, and I like this, you know, uh, 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 word of uh, Einstein, if you can't explain it, so you have to simplify it. It has to be easy for the reviewers to read. They have to really understand what you're going to do, and you're inviting them and actually provoking them to read, you know, further and further into the into the proposal. So this is very important. The summary page or the specific aim page. You know, where you state what you're going to do, spend as much time, read, uh, write and rewrite, refine and refine until exactly the person who's going to read it knows from the beginning. You can completely turn me off as a reviewer if I read the your summary page and I'm like, I still really don't understand what Dr. Adviti wants to do. Uh, let me read on, you know, further and further, you know, to see what she wants to do. You know, that's not good because you've already put yourself at a disadvantage. But if you spend time on this, you know, first summary page, it helps you also, you know, focus your ideas and summarize them. And, and you know, when you have aims, you don't want to put a thousand aims. You don't want to put 10 aims. You have to be smart enough to put three aims. Or if it's a short grant, two aims. Very brief. And very few statements related to your aims as how, you know, you're going to answer that. Um, that's, you know, what they look for. Uh, if they, you know, some reviewers, believe it or not, will throw a grant away if they don't understand what the work is from the first page that they read it. So the next, the next one uh, is um, the background and significance page. 
So in the background and significance page, this is where you build the case. You know, and normally for an NIH grant, you're looking at, you know, let's say we're, you know, we're talking about short proposals of six pages. So one page, you know, uh, summary and aims, no, you know, that's not gonna be counted. Now you have six pages to present, you know, present your case. So in the background and significance, this is where you briefly sketch the background leading to the present application. You're critically evaluating what is known, the knowledge that's there. You're trying to uh, concisely state the importance and relevance of the research that you are going to be you know, describing in this application. Uh, everything from the very beginning, a good grant writer. There are some people that are very good grant writers, but they produce very little, but they get all the money because they know how to write a good grant. Everything has to flow from the specific aims to the background and significance to the methods to the results, it all has to flow together and with one thread, you know, and you describe it in the same order in the same sequence. Uh, and so your background and significance has to also be related, you know, to your aims. Uh, what are you going to achieve and what in new knowledge or practice will be advanced, you know, in this application? Um, the impact of new methods or concepts or technologies. I've put down like a funnel for you. Uh, really, what is the topic? What is important? You don't want to remember, you're not writing a book. You're not writing a paper. You're not writing a review. You have to, you are writing an application, six page application, and you need relevant information. You need to be able to get the relevant background. What has been done? What is the topic? You have to really explain the significance of uh, what you're going to do uh, and what you have learned from others and really clearly state what is remains to be known and how you plan through this proposal to answer this. Very important here is relevance. You don't want to prove to the reviewers that you've read, you know, hundreds of papers and you summarize them and now you have a new idea. It has to be relevant. And that's the important part of having a good background and significance section. Now, in some grants, you know, they want preliminary data uh, or preliminary studies. But if you if you uh, include preliminary studies or you require to include preliminary studies, please don't just put any you know preliminary data that you have. It has to be of good quality. Because if you give me some preliminary data and I will look at your preliminary data and it's not convincing, I'm not even gonna read more. I'm not even gonna trust you, you know, that you are just writing something and you're exaggerating or you're misrepresenting. So the quality of your preliminary data must be high. If you have good preliminary data, include it. If you don't have good preliminary data, please don't include it because it might really undermine, you know, your proposal and you might not be very successful. So you have to be very strategic in what you offer. Everyone knows it's preliminary, you know, it's pilot studies, but, you know, if, if it's good, it's gonna convince the reviewer, yes, they've already done experiment A and look, they already proved that they can do this technique. They already have experience in it. I can see an image, I can see a graph that convinces me the applicants or the applicants as a group are really going to be able to execute this plan. So preliminary studies may be required or they may not be required. If you have them, make sure they're good data. Make sure you spend a lot of time to make them also every graph, every image you put there should be of such high quality and such detail and so nice and so attractive that the reviewers are going to respect your work and appreciate it, you know, and read on. So the next section, I mean, and this does not necessarily have to be in the same, you know, order, is the research design and methods. And when you are describing, you know, the research, you know, uh, framework, the procedures and analysis, you have to include how the data is going to be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. Uh, how this, if you're, you know, introducing a new technique and a new methodology. 
how this methodology is a better than existing, you know, uh, methods or techniques, what's the advantage of that? If you have novel, you know, concepts, you discuss them. If you're using new approaches, tools, uh, you know, the research design, uh, it does not need to have the detail that you would put in a publication so people can repeat, you know, what you did and maybe reproduce your work. It has to be rich enough to convince the reviewer You've thought about the design, you've thought about the methods, you've thought about the data you're going to, to get, you've thought of how you're going to analyze, you know, the data uh, and, you know, or how you're going to share that data. So it's very important that, you know, you describe your methods. You have to convey through these methods that, you know, what you're doing. Uh, if I read your methods and I don't, you know, get the feel that, you know, what you're doing. Uh, then, you know, I, I will have my doubts. The other thing is, you know, this is a mistake early career investigators make, students make, I have made it. When you're early in your career, you don't like to get advice. You know, you like to just think you know everything or you don't want to share, you know, how your vulnerabilities or you can't say, you know, Yes, I'm sure if I do it, you know, ABC, a, you're going to get this result and that result. It's actually a reviewer is going to respect you more and is going to be more interested in your work if you state, you know, the potential difficulties and limitations. Don't say everything is going to work perfect if we do it and we're going to do it this way. You have to really have a section in your research design and methods where you're discussing and say, here's, you know, um, potential, you know, difficulties or limitations. If we do it this way, we expect that we may encounter this and, you know, and that's going to affect the results and we may not achieve the aims. Um, so state potential limitations, difficulties, whatever title you want to give it, but also a reviewer is going to appreciate your work if you say, if we encounter, you know, this difficulty, uh, then we're going to uh, change our approach or we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do X and Y to try to overcome that. Uh, when you include, you know, potential, you know, complications in your methods and design, uh, and also include, you know, how you're going to react if you encounter these and how you're going to solve them, Reviewers are going to say, yes, this is an honest person. This is a, an applicant or a group of applicants that have thought about what could go wrong. If you don't tell me that anything could go wrong, then you're not a rational investigator. And that way I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, encouraged. A sequence of timetable, uh, a Gantt, you know, uh, uh, graph when you're going to do what at what uh, stage and how the sequence and timetable for the work uh, uh, point out if you know in if there are any procedures or situations or if there are hazardous materials to personnel what will you do you know as a precaution to uh, um, in, in a, you know counter that be succinct be you know precise enough description of the design and methods because remember these are you know, expert reviewers, they are peer reviewers. They are like you, you know, they, you don't need to tell them how to, you know, pipette something. <laughs> so they, they know the work. So, you know, you know, convince them enough in the research design and methods that you can do the work, uh, convince them that you've thought about potential complications and you have backup plans. Uh, and all of that has to be succinct because we're not, you know, there is no room. Remember, by now, we have the background and the methods and the preliminary data. Uh, pretty much, you know, all of that has to fit into, uh, um, you know, five or six pages. Uh, and, and, you know, how much room, you know, images and graphs, you know, can take. And so just be, you know, very, you know, uh, 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 strategic. Uh, if your work has involves human subjects, like a lot of the work that goes on at QBRI is translational research, 
then there has to be an institutional review board uh, for, you know, for any research that involves the human subjects. The process for consideration of protection and risks is their consent. Are you including, you know, women, minorities, and children in the U.S.? So that's very important for human subjects research. You know, and that panel called an IRB. Uh, I don't have time to explain to you the constitution of that, but will determine whether you should go ahead and uh, do your research. Even if you are at a university, you know, all our students who are working on human subjects have to get IRB approval before they start doing their work. If your work involves, you know, animal, you know, research uh, using the NIH format, there's, you know, four or five areas you have to pay attention to. You have to justify why you're using animals, and you have to justify the number of animals. You have to identify the species, the strain, the age, and you have to explain you're going to great lengths to make sure you're using as little but enough power, statistical power, to get, you know, the results that you're going uh, to uh, achieve. Uh, you have to describe the procedures, you know, that you're minimizing discomfort and pain to the animals when you're administering, you know, uh, uh, agents, uh, you know, uh, to them. Uh, you have to describe how you euthanize them and that you're going to use, you know, approved methods of uh, euthanization and so on and so forth. So there is a vertebrate, you know, animal, you know, section as well. Uh, <clears throat> also included for you a budget. This is very important. You know, for any proposal, you must have a budget because you're not only just asking for someone to tell you, great, this is a fantastic idea. You're also asking them to give you money. Uh, and so you have to have a budget. The budget, you know, has to be clear enough where it depicts all the expenditures that are involved in carrying out the research project. Um, that you have to justify every part of it. I'm going to have a postdoc, and the postdoc will do experiment X, Y, and Z, and will be paid, you know, this much. Uh, this is the benefits. Uh, this person will be paid for how many years? I have to have, you know, a student. You have to justify the role of each person in the, you know, in the proposal, from the PI, co-PI, postdoc, students, technicians, others, have to be justified and have to be explained what is the role of that. And all expenses, whether it's expenses for supplies, expenses for equipment, expenses for animals, you know, uh, have to be there. So you have to follow basically the agency guidelines, depending on which organization you're applying to. Very important to follow their budget, you know, rules. Very important to fine tune, you know, your budget. Um, don't ask for too much. And at the same time, don't ask for too little. You know, reviewers know how much it takes to do the work. They all have research teams, you know, they're experts, you know, agencies or organizations have people who have experience. If this work you're asking for, you know, can be done with $100,000, don't ask for a million dollars because they're not, you know. At the same time, if you're proposing so many things and you're only asking, you know, for $50,000 when you really need $200,000, then you're shooting yourself. So you have to be very measured, very important for you to uh, do that. In the United States, obviously, other countries have not learned the secret, and maybe soon they will. You will get the money to, you know, to execute the research project. And you have to explain, and you have to justify every part of it, and that's called the direct cost of the uh, project or the proposal. Then your university gets what we call indirect, you know, money or overhead money for the electricity, the power, the facilities they provide, you know, for you. Uh, and this indirect is negotiated between a university and the National Institutes of Health. And that money goes to them and it goes to their black box. They don't have to justify, they don't have to tell it. That's how universities there in the US have become so active in research because every investigator is going to bring them money, sometimes 50%. They give you 1 million and they give your university 1 million. You have to explain what you're going to do with the 1 million. They keep the other 1 million. Technically, they're supposed to use it for supporting research, but they don't have to itemize it and explain it. Now, uh, and finally, 
uh, the literature cited. So there's no limits, you know, for, you know, the background, the literature, you know, that you're going to uh, uh, list. Uh, you have to list all the references. Uh, every agency has its format. Uh, NIH likes to know the titles, names, authors, whatever. But very important, you know, don't be very exhaustive in your literature back, you know, search and your literature that you're citing. You know, only it has to be relevant to the current literature, relevant to the project that you're doing, and not to prove to me you read 500 publications and it's so rich. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking as a reviewer uh, as, you know, as to how, uh, where you find this information. I may check on your literature as your reviewer if you say so and so found this, and based on that, we're going to do that. I may read, you know, that, you know, and pull that paper. So, relevant information, not exhaustive list, you know, uh, of uh, references, uh, everything you have read. And it's relevant to the background, so that's where a lot of the references are going to come. So, very important is relevant and uh, only needed uh, references. Um, and finally, I'm going to use this, you know, to try to uh, show you it's not just about, uh, you know, writing a good uh, uh, proposal. Uh, you really, uh, the scoring, you know, the current way it changes every few years. Is from one to nine, and in the NIH, look at this. They are looking at strengths and weaknesses. Everything has strengths and weaknesses. You know, the best proposals are going to have mostly strength and almost negligible weaknesses. But as the weaknesses increase and increase and increase, then you know your proposal is getting a worse and worse and worse score. Uh, and you know, depending on the agency and you know the overall impact score, in order for you to get money, if you score in the exceptional one, then you may you will be funded. You have a very high chance that you'll get funded. Or two, you have a very high chance of getting funded. So keep in mind, you don't want to just write a very good proposal. You know, you're not gonna get money here. Uh, you may not get money even if you write an excellent proposal. Okay, so you are you need to fine tune everything that you do and everything that you write so you can become outstanding and exceptional. That way, you know you guarantee uh, uh, that you're going to get a good score enough for you to get the money. It's okay to get a very good you know uh, score and then come back next time and become outstanding, or write an excellent score you know uh, grant and then come back and be exceptional on the second round. So that's gonna take one year, six months, and then you get the information, you fix it. Uh, it's very time you know, consuming. Um, but the very, the very first thing they're gonna do if you study, they're gonna score you or not. So if they have 100 grants, 50 of them are gonna be returned to you without even a score on the scale from one to nine. So 50% will be returned, just as they are, out of the 100 proposals that they were assigned. They're asked to just, you know, triage. The 50 lowest ones will be sent back. You'll get comments so you can go back and work, but that's an end score. They're not scored. And that's bad thing when you're unscored. You need to really listen to what the reviewer said and you want to fix it and then come back. If you get a score and you're an early career investigator, just getting a score is good. And hopefully your score is here at a five. And then you really work hard to move back up there. Very, very, very rare will someone from the first time they write the grant get a score of one or two. Very rare. You know, they may start with a four and then end up with a two or start with a five, end up with a two, or they go back you know, to a one. So remember this. It's not about writing a very good proposal or even an excellent proposal. You're aiming to be outstanding. You're aiming to increase your chances where you're at this spot here in order to be funded and be able to keep your research going. So I'm gonna stop here and I hope I, you know, I uh, presented to you 
fundamental elements of a proposal using the NIH format from aims and background and methods and budgets and other things that we discuss and preliminary data uh, and trying to convey to you that um, if you're writing a proposal and you're looking for funding, it has to be near perfect. And then you need to work and work and rework and write and rewrite to get you know, to that stage. There are so many fantastic ideas in the world and every one of us has a hundred ideas a day, but there are only very, very few ideas that are others to be able to give you the money to do them. And I hope these principles and concepts that you heard today will help you in your life and even in your work, if whether you're writing a small proposal for a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, or whether you're writing a fellowship, you know, if you're a student or for a scholarship, or you're writing, you know, a project if you're a biomedical scientist, a biomedical engineer, or others, the common elements, the important elements of uh, grant writing. And uh, I will uh, stop. Uh, uh, sharing now uh, and really uh, uh, address uh, your your questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser, for this very informative presentation and for walking us through the process of grant writing from scratch with all the details of the crucial elements uh, in a grant proposal. Before moving to our next uh, part in this webinar, I would like to remind our audience to please send their questions using all panelists option in the Q&A tab. Uh, so now focusing on our target uh, audience for today and to continue customizing this webinar for early career researchers, I would like to discuss uh, with you, Dr. Nasser, a couple of uh, concerns to continue learning from your expertise. Let me start with the other options of funding like global and international grants, which are very prestigious, but at the same time, very competitive. For young scientists uh, interested in these grants, what's the best way to sort uh, through overseas uh, research opportunities? And uh, what make our applications uh, stand out? Um. I, I, I don't know if I have enough, you know, knowledge to redirect you to specific organizations, whether within Qatar or whether international organization in Europe uh, or the uh, UN. Uh, that's probably, you know, uh, usually at every organization, there are people in the research division who alert you and who direct you to where you should go and apply. You could get, you know, seek their advice uh, and they tell you really which organization or where the money you know uh, is being offered by who? For example, at our universities and common in American universities, every day in your mailbox you get a funding opportunity. <clears throat> they try to tell you this organization is offering this. This is they're looking for this. This is the amount of money. This is a good you know application for you. But you know, uh, regardless of who you apply to, it's really the same principles. You know, this week and last week, I reviewed grants. You know, for the uh, from Spain, you know, for uh, a, a TV3 uh, Morato or something, you know, an organization that does uh, raises funds for neurodegenerative diseases, uh, you know, from Spanish investigators, and then has been reviewed by, you know, uh, uh, international reviewers. And same elements, you look at it, it's not the same NIH format, it's not in the same order or organization. Everyone is going to look for innovation, novelty. Everyone is going to ask for the impact. Will this work be impactful? How is it going to impact? Will it advance our knowledge? Uh, so really the same elements are going to be there. Um, it's very important to familiarize yourself and at what stage in your career, what funding opportunities are available for you. And to research that individually and with the help of a research office and talking to others, and then very important is read, you know, read the requests, read what they're asking for and write for that and follow their rules and their page limits and their budgets. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser, for all your uh, actionable advices. My next point uh, relates to what you were saying earlier in your presentation about being a strategic accent uh, right in a clear and concise uh, style. 
when someone is also carrying uh, marketing skills, and nowadays remote working is reshaping a future a new world of work, of work. Uh, can professional grant writing be a new profession? What skills are needed to be a professional uh, grant writer? Any advice for early career uh, scientists uh, interested in this type of work? So, uh, you know, people ask me, and even with COVID and all of that, what is going to happen with biomedical research? And I say, this is a great time. People are going to give us, they finally appreciate us as scientists and engineers. They're going to give us more money to do research. And I think there will be more money and more opportunities to do that. Um, and, you know, being at home, we can be very, very productive. This is a perfect time, you know, to write a grant. You know, I'm working on something myself because you're at home where you can research, you can get the literature, you can. So it's a very good time to uh, use it. Professional grant writing, so it depends on how, what you're asking me. Does that mean you write, you know, grants, um, you know, for others and you get paid for it? Uh, uh, or is it mean uh, uh, you keep writing so many grants you become a professional grant writer yourself or yourself? Um, uh, as a reviewer, I don't want to read you know a proposal that someone else has written for you. I'm just going to throw that out you know the window because uh, I I want to read you know and score and award a proposal that you have done. And not use a professional grant writer. Now, that's for individuals, for scientists, for postdocs. Uh, obviously, if it's an organization, because we haven't talked about the min different kinds of grants. There are grants that are given to you as an investigator. There are grants that are given to the institution to build infrastructure. Uh, there are grants, you know, that are given to a state, like you know, the network that I you mentioned that I was part of heading. Uh, so it depends on what type of grant. What you need is uh, we provide a lot of help, like attending this grant writing proposal. You take, you know, the best practices and you get the uh, professional advice and you use it to fine tune it. Uh, in the US, in our university, obviously we want to get money to the university if we are going to stay. Otherwise, they will, you know, fire us from our jobs because we live on the money that we bring. Uh, there are professional advisors. There are people like in Washington D.C. that our university, you know, pays uh, consultants that will help direct us what is the best thing, you know, to apply for, how to apply for it. Um, uh, there are paid consultants, so it's okay to use consultants, uh, not as an early career. So we're talking here in today's presentation, early career scientists, right? Uh, but use consultants. Um, if you're looking for big grants, institutional grants, national grants, uh, to help you fine tune it and uh, uh, and so on, you know that's that's really important. But for as a student and as a postdoc and early career one, you want consultants. You want feedback. What I'm discouraging, just to be clear, is you pay someone. And they write the whole grant, they come up with the idea and so on. The professional grant writers, it looks perfect. You submit it in your name, you know, and you get funded for that. To me, that's no no. Unless it's done for an organization, unless it's done for a different purpose. But um, really learning how to write proposals, getting advice, and this is a key thing a big mistake early career uh, researchers do. They write a grant proposal and they don't have anyone read it. They just send it to the reviewer. When you do that, that's a big, big mistake, you know, because no one has criticized your work. And we are in a discipline where we are used for self-criticism, peer criticism. We submit publications, they get returned, rejected, then we submit somewhere else. Uh, we train, you know, all the way as, you know, graduate students, all the way as postdocs, how to uh, get feedback, criticism, accepted rejections, and so on. You should have people read it. You should get as much feedback. You should consult with someone. This is mentoring. You should have a mentor. Usually for good institutions, when you have an early career person, such as yourself, they have a mentor there who helps them. They read their grant proposals. They read their drafts. They give them feedback. Uh, we have a grant chats, you know, lunches. 
for writing grants uh, where we all have lunch and we review one proposal and you know from a peer a colleague and someone paid for our lunch <laughs> and we criticize it we tear it apart you know and that person has to hear all the worst criticism we don't have any praise and the person takes these and goes back and reworks them and have a very good grant proposal when your early career you feel shy, you feel vulnerable, you don't ask for feedback, for criticism, and you suffer through the review process. When you are a more senior or you know, investigator like myself, I like more and more people read it. More and more feedback I get, the final product will be best. Thank you so Thank you much, so much. Nasser, for your advice and for all your insights and knowledge shared with us today. So now moving on uh, to the last part of our webinar, let's go over the questions from uh, the audience. Question number one, any advice on realistic timelines to complete writing a thorough grant proposal? So um, I, you cannot write you know, a grant proposal in one month and expect, it depends at what level you're competing and who you're writing. Uh, but to give you an idea, since we are discussing the NIH format, uh, and from my personal experience, uh, in some cases, you know, I may spend uh, three to four months writing a 10-page you know, grant proposal because I'm thinking through it. I'm thinking about the data I'm going to share, the graphs I'm going to put there. I'm refining every part. Uh, three months is not uh, unusual. Uh, if you try to write a grant in one month, it's not, it's not going to work. Obviously, you can't write them in a day or in a week. So we're talking, you know, depending on what stage you're at. I mean, if you are a student and writing a thesis proposal, one month is enough. But if you are an early career investigator and you want to be funded, and we're talking, you're looking for something 100,000 or more, uh, you should be spending a couple of months on that. Uh, and so you really have to strategically plan when you are writing, uh, maybe the summer is a good time to write when there is no classes, no teaching. Uh, the more time you spend, you know, the more realistic it is. Some big grants, which I have been involved in, institutional grants or much larger multi-million dollar grants that involve many participants may take a year to two to write. You know, and sometimes people are preparing for that. So the big, you know, big, big grants, we're talking a year to two to grant. So depending on, you know, what you are doing. So, I mean, remember, you know, you want to be in that tight spot where you're exceptional uh, and you can't be exceptional by working on something one week or two weeks or one month, but, you know, several months. And you got you have to be resilient. You look at the deadline, for example, right now, investigators in the U.S., if we're NIH, we're looking at the October deadline or the September deadline for grants. People are already writing them, you know, from June and maybe from May. Or you got something, got rejected and unscored, you spend another couple of months on it to send it back. Uh, in the life cycle for investigators in the US, to get an R1, which I mentioned is a gold standard, when they hire faculty, you give them five years. Uh, it may, I mean, right now for an American investigators, the age to get an R, you know, R01, the standard one, the big grant, you know, is 45 or so. It used to be 35. So you can imagine, uh, and if you are hired in a university, they give you five years to get this big grant. And so from the first year you are hired, you're working on getting that grant in order to be promoted to the next level. That's great, thank you for an answer. Uh, when yeah. applying for a fellowship as a postdoc, how to successfully balance between the expertise we hold and the new skills we aspire to learn? I, I think you have to, you know, sell yourself, you know, for fellowships, you know, for example, my students, and I don't want to brag, has an NIH, you know, fellowship, and she scored, you know, the top 1%. Um, you have to you know, sell yourself to reviewers. 
You have to show your strength, what you're able to do. There has to be really in fellowships, it's different, you know, writing a fellowship than writing a grant to do just the research. Sometimes the research aspect of what you're going to do is part of the proposal, maybe of your mentor or the principal investigator is not as important as the other things. Like what have you done, you know, in your career? How many things have you published before? How successful were you, you know, in your in your life? How involved were you? What kind of qualities, you know, uh, do you have? How do you sell yourself, you know, as a potential future scientist, you know, that we want to give you a, a chance? So promoting and advocating and presenting yourself in the best light, and what statements and what you know summaries that you describe why you are in science, what you want to do in science. The other soft stuff, and not exactly the project, is more important than why you will be a promising, you know, scientist. And obviously, there has to be a research project uh, that you're going, your fellowship is is connected to. Uh, but really, the other aspects. So that balance is very important. You don't want to undersell your skills and what you have and what stage you are. And you don't want to exaggerate what you'll become if they give you the fellowship. And so that's a very tricky one. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Considering the time and the effort that goes into grant writing and the low success rate, what's uh, your advice on recycling and successful grants? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think it's, it came from someone who has experienced that, and I have experienced, you know, rejected and failed, you know, grants. It's a, the key is if you don't get a score, you know, I'm, so obviously I'm giving you my experience and I'm relating this NIH and things like that, things I'm very familiar with. If you have an unscored grant, which means they read it, they said some things to you, but they didn't even give you a score. Um, if you're gonna recycle that unscored grant, then you really need to do a lot of new things to make it look very new. And you have to maybe find a different agency to submit it to a different review section that has not seen it. Uh, if you feel you got the advice and you reshape it uh, and you can resubmit it, because you really invested a lot of time in that. But the best grants to recycle or to re, you know, bring back is they maybe got a score, but they weren't funded. And, you know, and that's what you know universities look for. If you got a score, and it was a score of five, you know, but they didn't give you the money, that's an excellent grant to bring back because you might be able to bring it to a three and maybe eventually get it, you know, funded if it's a perfect one or two. Um, but if you got a score that's nine, which is poor or actually better than getting a score of nine, which is poor. Because when you're unscored, you know, they just didn't score it. And uh, there are many reasons why they did not score it. But if you got a score of nine, that means there are reviewers. There's one reviewer who loved it so much, gave it a one, and one reviewer gave it a nine, you know, and you average it out. And so there's something fundamentally flawed or there's disagreement among two or three reviewers, uh, it makes your grant very controversial. So um, you have to be strategic what you're going to recycle. You have to uh, listen and accept, you know, what the reviewer said and is it fixable? Can I do a few more experiments and come back? You know, can I represent it in a certain way? Listen to the reviewers and send it back to them. You know, in my early career, I was getting very upset when I get grants rejected. They are so stupid and they don't understand what they're doing. And I know, I can't believe you said that this person did not even read the grant and you get very upset. When you grow up, <laughs> then you say, you know what? They were right. I should have done this and I should have done that. So it hurts, you know, when you spend six months writing a grant and then it's returned to you. Uh, you know, it takes me, it's like the death of someone special. I would be sad for a few days, then I come out of that and start working on something else. Um, 
So you have to be resilient and you have to re come back and, but you have to be strategic and not just don't keep doing the same thing over, over again and ex expect to be successful. You need to change something fundamental in the draft. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we conclude today's webinar about grant writing. Thank you very much to our presenter, Dr. Nasser. I personally leaving this webinar with a clear defined strategy of grant writing, feeling positive, motivated, and excited for the next three steps. And thank you all for joining us today. And if you have further questions, please feel free to contact us. I'd uh, like to extend my thanks to the amazing uh, team working behind the scenes, Dr. Adviti, HBKU, and QBRI Communications, as the Dean, Reem, and Omar. Just uh, one final thing, when you exit the webinar, we would appreciate you filling out the survey that will pop up on your screen. Uh, stay safe, stay tuned for more inspiration in our next webinars. Thank you.